I love my family back in Chongqing, and also I have a chosen family here in Shanghai.、Mm-hmm. I have four mothers. <laughs> Welcome to Mosaic of China, a podcast about people who are making their mark in China. I'm your host Oscar Fuchs. There are two themes in today's show. The first is location. Three years ago, I would have said that my personal lifestyle was completely location agnostic. I don't say that so much these days, since I haven't stepped off the Chinese mainland in all this time. When someone feels dislocated, that's not a good thing. But is there also something you can call being overlocated? I've managed to heal myself of this feeling of overlocation by going to places that remind me of my previous lifestyle, heading to the parts of China that border closely with Thailand or Myanmar or Korea or Tajikistan. It's not the same as traveling to those places, but at least it's close. So it's funny to have discovered a place on the Chinese mainland that surprised me by reminding me so closely of Hong Kong, despite the two cities being many miles apart. If you haven't already guessed where I'm talking about, you'll figure it out pretty soon. The second theme of today's show is queer identity. Honestly, it's not a subject we can talk about too explicitly on this show, but I've done my best to cover this topic from a few angles. At one point, we discussed the reaction in China to the Oscar-winning movie Moonlight. At one point, we discussed the queer scene in Shanghai, and at one point, we discussed language that is homophobic and even racially prejudiced. The tone of this whole episode is energetic, playful, and provocative. But while my guest and I are both having fun, we do so knowing full well that we're talking about some very serious issues. So, with that little trigger warning in effect. Let's start the show. Thank you very much, Xiaoxiao. <laughs> How am I saying your name wrong? Actually, when you do the podcast with Coco Sante, you both say my name wrong. Well, let's, <laughs> let's get your name right first.、Okay. So, give me the tones as well, so I can try and get that right. Xie is first tone.、Mm-hmm. Xiao is the first tone. Okay, Xiaoxiao. Yeah. Okay. Some foreigners think this sounds like shit show. <laughs> I quite like that though. <laughs> Your life is a shit show. I mean, kind of because my very close friend called me Diarrhea Queen because I have very poor stomach. <laughs> I shit a lot. Well, we've gone straight to the most personal <laughs> part of your life. <laughs> well, I want to talk about Coco Santi, who referred you. But before we do, let's talk about the object that you have prepared. Okay. That in some way represents your life in China. So, what is it? You know, I participated in Shanghai Queer Film Festival. It's the local queer film festival founded in Shanghai. Every year, we'll invite some local artists to do some like special postcards. Oh, sorry, I just broke it. <laughs> so each one of them are very beautiful. They chose one queer film and make a postcard. Well, can you leave them out? Because I want to have them on display while we're okay, talking. Okay, sure. A lot of what we're going to talk about is your work. Why don't we start with that then? So tell me, what is the Shanghai Queer Film Festival? Okay. First of all, I participated in several queer groups in Shanghai. Shanghai Queer Film Festival is just one of them. When I just came in Shanghai, I I didn't know nobody,、mm. but I want to get in the community. So、uh, I met some friends. At one dinner, they said they're working with a、like, queer film festival. I didn't know that. What year was this? Two thousand and sixteen. Because I came in Shanghai in two thousand and sixteen. Where were you from originally? Chongqing is a hot pot city. Chongqing. Yeah. Do you know I've just been to Chongqing for the first time. Oh really? Yes. We'll come back to it. Okay. So they say they are working with Shanghai Film Festival, and I say, just put me in. Just put me in. I want to do anything. I just <laughs> want to participate in it. Nice. So I, that's why joining. Yeah. Okay. So what is your role with the festival? I manage the content base. Okay. Write articles and I take charge of the、uh, social media content. Do you also have a hand in choosing which films are selected? No, that's other groups. Like、okay. a short film group and featuring film group. What films have you shown in the past? Actually, I think everyone can just check our official WeChat group, Shanghai Queer Film Festival. Every year, it's not very easy to do a queer film festival in Shanghai. So every time when we successfully hold an event, we consider it like a huge success. That's meaningful. Not the films we're screening, but the event itself. That's right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you just for an example of one of the films that you would have seen. Did it have some kind of impact on you? Uh, the film is called "Latest in Waiting." Ladies, latest, latest is a word in Tonga. Tonga is a Pacific nation.、Um, the latest means trans woman.、Mm. 
So latest in waiting is a documentary shows trans women in Tonga how they're living. Uh, it's really interesting. There's a huge trans community in a Pacific island nation. Yeah. Actually, they have a very big trans culture in Tonga. But when the British people came, I'm sorry, oh, yeah, suddenly that people just don't like them anymore. Yes, and you make an interesting point about the British Empire because a lot of the <laughs> a lot of the laws which are now seen by the West as anti LGBTQ plus came from that era, right? Never banned before. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So now we in the West look down on these people, say, "Hey, you know, get with the program." But actually, they don't realize that it's because of the West. That yeah, they have it, these laws. Be- because like in most of the countries. They actually have rights. The culture accept them before. Yeah. Well, let's talk about then China, because you were holding this festival in Shanghai. And as you say, it's not easy. What do you mean by that? Um, all the events must be free. Mm-hmm. We can charge money. Yes. And it's very hard to find a place to show the films. Mm-hmm. We can't just show in the cinema. So we need to raise money. And we need to find a place to screen. And we need to organize dozens of people. We're all volunteering in this group. Right. Nobody gets any money. We're just doing it like for love. Yes. And that reminds me of an episode I did in season one on this show, which mm. was with a playwright called Nick Yu. And he explained the law that if you are selling a ticket, that's when you have to get in touch with the content board who helps to pass that film for public viewing, right? So yeah. the fact that you're not selling tickets, that means that you have a bit more freedom in terms of what you can show, correct? I mean, we can just say like it's someone's birthday. We're just holding a birthday party. Yes, yes. Which it is. I mean, it is a private group ultimately, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when you say the venue itself is hard to find, what do you mean by that? Sometimes when we reach to a venue, when we need to explain to the owner we wanted to show films, they will ask what kind of film you're showing. We explain, well, there will be gays and lesbians in films. Some owner will say, no, Mm. that's too sensitive. But luckily, we have some owner that are very willing to help us. Mm. Because it's not about the law. There's no law against it. It's It's very vague. Yes. There's no specific law that say that you can show queer films in China, but it's very vague, so nobody knows what to do. This is it. And that's what this kind of vague law promotes in terms of content creation, right? Yeah. But they don't know what we're going to show. So it's kind of like we fear them, they fear us also. Mm. So um, I'm quite used to it, and I, I don't think that's like much of a problem now. <laughs> yeah. But this is it, right? It becomes so normalized yeah. that you sort of work out how to exist within these boundaries. Yeah. Well, we talked at the beginning about Coco Santi and I both ruining the way that we said your name. Why don't we listen to that referral from last season? Here I is. just listened to it last night. <laughs> <laughs> there is an individual named Sri Xiao. He is one of the uh, heads for CinemaQ, uh, which is a queer film initiative in Shanghai. Uh, I think it would be really fun to have a conversation with him because he has great stories because he also does work with another program called Queer Talks as well. The first time I met her is when she's on a stage. Mm. There is a like drag competition in Luca. Um, they have two groups, professional group and amateur group. She actually was in amateur group, but oh. her performance is so good. And I feel, wow, that performance I remember really clearly. Nice. Back then, she didn't know me, but uh, Shanghai is very big. It's a massive city, but also Shanghai is a very small city for queer people. Mm -hmm. You know, we often go to like the same venue. We often go to the queer event. You always meet some people like familiar. So we see each other and I say hello, and she say hello, and we have a talk and we become friends. That's just how people met in Shanghai. It's actually nice when I hear you describe it because what you're describing is a real community. I think in many cities around the world, especially big cities like Shanghai, Mm -hmm. we're losing this community because a lot of the stuff is happening online, especially when it comes to meeting each other. A lot of stuff now is getting more mainstream. Here, there is still that close community. Do do you think that it's still the case five years later? Right now, I'm very satisfied. And right now, I'm very happy that I have such a community, that Mm. I have so many venues to visit, and I have so many friends that I can call them my family. Mm. You know, I love my original family back in Chongqing. They love me so much. I came out to them and they accept me and they embrace me. And also I have a chosen family here in Shanghai that also love them. Mm. I have four mothers. <laughs> I, I always say it's the same. You know why? Because I have my original family who accept me for who I am. And I know what family look like. 
I know what real family that will love you 100% look like. And what I feel about my original family in Chongqing and what I feel about my friends in Shanghai, I feel the same feeling. The feeling is exactly the same. So mm. the chosen family, you can call your family because that's real. Mm. And this phrase chosen family is quite common in LGBTQ circles, right? Yes. Would you say most people who came from other provincial cities to Shanghai, would they have had a different experience to your family in Chongqing? I'm very lucky. Right? Yeah, but it's very interesting. Many people will not tell my story. They say, is one of your parents living like foreign city or like right. living like American before? Because they sounded like so open-minded. But both my parents are born and raised in Chongqing. They're high school mates. Never go abroad. Didn't even go to Hong Kong or Macau before. But they're just open-minded. My father said, people who cannot accept diversity is the one who is unacceptable. How do you explain that? I know, I know, yeah, I'm just too lucky. My parents always said to me, well, are you happy? Wow. Are you tempted to have them talk with the parents of other queer people in China? I do want to, but they don't like the big city. It's, it's so crowded. Hang oh, on, hang on, stop, stop. <laughs> Chongqing is the most crowded place I've been to in China. That's why they don't like big city. They <laughs> always run away from Chongqing. Like, where are you? I'm in Tibet. Where are you? I'm in Xinjiang. All oh, right. Like they run marathon. They yeah. bike from Chongqing to Tibet. I should be interviewing your parents, man. These sound like amazing people. <laughs> now is a good excuse for me to talk about Chongqing because mm -hmm. it's one of those places that is not on most people's radars as foreigners, right? We haven't got the excuse to go there. Of course, we all know about Chongqing hot pot. Chongqing is very famous for hot pot. It's famous for maybe some politicians who used to be in charge. That's really the only thing that I knew about Chongqing before I went there. In fact, I went there because I was doing a layover between two cities and I thought, oh, I haven't been to Chongqing, so I might as well go through Chongqing and spend a weekend there. When I went there, it was like, wow, I don't know enough about China because it really had its own energy, which I was surprised at. It was like Hong Kong with this mainland China veneer on top. It was like, why has it taken me so long to be in Chongqing? And I, I'm very surprised too, because even in Chengdu, you can see like many foreigners, but in Chongqing, no, absolutely no, no zero. And it's no. millions of people, and I was the only foreigner, even in like yeah. the center of town. Do you know that maybe 20 years ago, they called Chongqing like the little Hong Kong because of the landscape? Yes, yes, yes. I'm glad it wasn't just me then, good. It's bigger than Hong Kong, actually. Yes. You know, Chongqing people also walk very fast. <laughs> And we have so many stairs. Oh, exactly. I couldn't believe it. I was following a map. I'm going from one place to the other. Never trust map when you're in Chongqing. <laughs> yes. Never trust. You just ask people. People will say, go up. What do you mean, go up? It's up. This is it. When I was following a map, I realized, no, I can't get there because there's a massive mountain in between me and yeah, that Maybe road. that cliff. Yes. <laughs> Which was such a beautiful situation because Shanghai is so flat. And I know. It's so boring, right? Especially when I first came here. This is talking like seven years ago. I came from Hong Kong, right? That was where I last lived. And then when I came to Shanghai, first of all, every corner was the same. I couldn't differentiate one road from the next. Well, yeah, have you ever been to Beijing? That's exactly the same. Because my aunt used to live in Beijing. So when I was a little kid, every summer I would visit Beijing. Every road is so straight. About like 30 minutes, never turn. Yes. It's such a miracle for me. I'm the same. I come from London, and that's a place that built out very organically. So all the roads are higgledy-piggledy. They have massive curves. So every time I'm in a very planned city, which is, let's say, most cities in the States, for example, they have blocks. I just feel like it's not human enough. We're not supposed to be so logical. <laughs> yeah. It was so weird. Some people will ask me, like, how would you feel like when people call you weird sometimes? Mm. I said, everybody's weird. Because nobody can fit all the stereotype or the principles that any society puts you. You're not a robot. You're not a program. We're at least a little bit weird. We all have our weird stuff. Exactly. Okay. Let's talk about the way that you talk with your friends, because this is something which I love. You know, the language that the queer community use between each other. Oh, my God. We create our own slant sometimes. Often, like in, within queer community, we absorb the negativity. You own it, right? Yeah, we, we own it, and yeah. we make that in a positive way. Right. That's, that's very common, right? It's very common, and I don't know if I can say that word here. F people call you f mm. because they hate you. Mm. But right now, we can use that proudly and say, yes, I am f mm. So what? Mm. You cannot hurt me with your so-called negative words right. anymore because we own that. And so what you're saying is there are equivalent words in Chinese, which you now own, but you don't want to say it on the podcast, for example. I can say it. Like, many people will call like, you're a sissy boy. 
Mm-hmm. We need more masculinity in China. So, like, we don't want boys in China like become like more sissy. We need more masculinity. Sissy boy is such a bad word for people, but we own that mm. so easily. We don't give a. F- I said, like, if you have a single bit of sissiness in your body, like in your system, just show it. And it's so much easier just being yourself completely. Well, that, but that's why I'm really impressed with people like you, because I think you're, what, 10 years younger than me? How old are you now? Uh, 29. Yeah, you're 15 years younger than me. And yet you've come to this conclusion way younger than I did. Because I tried also when I was in like a high school, maybe I tried to become like quote unquote normal. And I failed. I'm very bad at acting. <laughs> you have no choice. I have no choice but to accept myself. Mm. And I feel like, well, you just don't know what kind of potential you have in your body. Don't rush to come to a conclusion of yourself or trying to define yourself. Every definition is a limitation. Don't try to define queerness. That word don't need any definition. Do you say it in Chinese? Yeah, cool. Cool. Yeah, cool. It sounds cute. It yeah. just sounds cute. Yeah. So we've talked about how you feel accepted in Shanghai. Like, what is the status of LGBTQ plus people in Shanghai, in China right now? Um, every city is different. Every province is different. Right. And even in one city, I know people who wouldn't dare to come out to anybody. They're living in Shanghai too. So different people think a different way. Like in some people's mind, gay people and lesbian people are like separated. Mm. Also, like there is Chinese queer people group and foreigners. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just don't know why people are so interested in like, putting people in different kind of boxes. Sometimes you feel like enjoy that, and I just think that's ridiculous. Yes, there are racism in China, and yes, there's xenophobia in China, and yes, within queer community also. Right. That doesn't mean that this queer community in China is very depressed. That depends on what kind of community you want to join and what kind of community you want to be. Mm. You know what, you're making me think about something which, if you're in the community, you've heard this, but maybe there are people listening who have never heard this, foreigners versus Chinese people within the queer community. There are a few phrases that I've heard. Okay. It's about rice. Rice queen? Yes. It means basically a foreigner that found of East Asian people. Yep. What's the equivalent from the other way around? I don't know, what were other words, potato? Potato. Actually, this is the first time I heard You've that. never heard of potato queen? No. <laughs> That's what you would call an East Asian who is looking for a white guy. Oh, wow. A potato queen. We call that different in China. Xi Tan mei. Xi Tan means Western food. Uh, yeah, because it's about food. It is about food. Okay, so what do you call it when there are two East Asians who are attracted to each other? Do you have a word for that? Because we do in English. Oh, really? Yes. Two East Asian, like, funny. No, we don't have that. Sticky rice. Wow. (laughs) It's terrible. This is it. This is the kind of racist language that exists within the queer community. Yes. If you can use your logic here, what do you think? Mashed potato? You got it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We're laughing about it. It's wrong, right? It's wrong. And we can talk about it because there is an issue. That's why we need to talk about it. Mm. But we need to understand why this word exists, why it's bad, and what can we improve it? Should we just cancel it or use it again, but in a different way? Yeah. They're just words. It's how we define them, how we use them. Yeah. You know, what I know from people's profiles on dating apps, they would specifically say things like no Asians, you know. no. Oh, there's so many examples. Right. I know. It's really prevalent that we can be in a community which is oppressed in some ways, and yet we can still, within our community, oppress others. Yes, I find that that's very interesting. You know, every dating app in China, mm. they will say, like, no foreigners or no Asians. You no, see? And I feel like, hello. We desperately wanted to let the whole world treat us as human beings, but we treated ourselves as the meat and vegetables at the market. (laughs) That's ridiculous. Yeah, there is some kind of deep-rooted self-loathing, self-hatred. Yes, that's like traitors of being queer. Is that really who you are? Mm. If you are comfortable, I praise you. (laughs) But if you're not, that means you're not happy. Yeah. 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 The way I actually accept the word queer Mm -hmm. is I think about it in terms of, right, procreation. Procreation procreation means having a baby. Okay. But that's, in quotes, normal, right? Anything which doesn't lead to procreation, anything which is not that, you could call queer. So what, what I mean by that is if there is a heteronormative couple and they're not doing anything which is going to lead to a baby being born, that's queer. Yeah. What you find out when you define it that way is that everybody is queer. Everybody has done things in sure. the privacy of their bedroom, sure. which doesn't lead to creating babies. Everyone. 
Yeah, my expression is a little bit different, but I also believe everybody is queer. I mean, if you ever have any sexual fantasy, that means you're queer. If you don't have any sexual fantasy, that means you're asexual. That also queer. There you go. So end of story. We're all defined under that one umbrella. Yeah. I guess the issue is right now representation in China, where you and I can have this conversation on this English-speaking podcast. If we were doing a TV show in China, we couldn't talk this openly, right? I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe I'm not sure. You know, like the laws are very vague. We don't know. Well, you certainly don't see it right now. No. And you certainly see the opposite. You certainly see now the messaging coming out about it's a shrinking population, right? So there's a demographical issue that you have to make more children in China. But then, how in that case do you think you can create more people who are like your parents, who are understanding and accepting? First of all, we just talk. We just share our minds. We share our thoughts. Every time when we like do talk, I can see that something is happening. Even it's very tiny little bit. Every talk matters. And also, like with Instant Q, people like often said, "Oh, why do you choose to use screening films as a tool to like sending message or something?" Uh, Matthew was one of the co-founders of Instant Q, and also everybody else thinks the same way because movie is fun. People like watching movie, and what we're showing is queer movie, which is more interesting.、Mm. That's it. It's very simple. Just have fun. Yeah. Girls just want to have fun. <laughs> you mentioned Matthew. He's someone who has been behind Cinem Q. She's like my third or fourth mother. Matthew Barron. Yes. So let's talk about that. Tell me about your four mothers.、Uh, my first mother is my biological mother in Chongqing. I love her so much. We're like sisters.、Uh, so each time we like hang out in the street, we go shopping, <laughs> we drink bubble tea, and we talk about men. That my first mom.、Mm-hmm. My second mom is my college friend. She's so funny. <laughs> She's the one who actually told me, you know, being a slut is not a bad thing. It's、oh. how you own your body,、mm. but you make sure it's safe. Yeah, well, this is a whole feminist aspect we haven't even talked about. But keep going. <laughs> yeah, the third or fourth mother is Matthew Barron and Will Dye. Ah, they're partners, right? Yeah, I'm gonna tell you a story how I met them. One night, won the Oscar. Ah, yes. And I got very angry because there's so many Chinese reviews are so bad. People say I just don't like black people. Oh, people say this film only won the Oscar is only because the political correctness. Oh, the PC issue has gone too far in Western country. Blah 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 blah. There's so many of them. Of course, there are so many people very like this film, including me and including many other people. Moonlight is kind of like a bomb to explode all the issues out on the surface.、Mm. And the type in the WeChat group said,、uh, "I want to write an article to discuss that." And so Matthew in that group replied to me, said, "You need to write the article." So. I wrote it and I sent it to them. They got published, and we never met before. And、um, mm-hmm. there's one time, one night, I was、uh, sitting outside of a bar, and I just saw Matthew and Will passing by, and they just approached, saying, "Hello, you don't know me, but I know you." <laughs> and that's the first time I met them. And that's how you got into Cinema Q. That night changes mm. everything. Mm. And that's why we're here today. Xie Xiao, thank you very much. Let's move on to part two. Okay. All right, let's jump straight in. Question one from Shanghai Daily: What is your favorite China-related fact? The thing that most impressed me is how China changes so fast.、Mm. Every year is different. I don't even recognize where I grew up. The building is gone.、Mm. Everything is gone. The、mm. road is gone. Mountains is gone. Yes. Every time when I go back to Chongqing, I know that she's always beautiful and she's always fierce. <laughs> but Is that a city? I know. I just hope that the characteristic don't change. Yeah. What is one physical representation of Chongqing? Is there like something which you think, ah, I'm back in Chongqing when you see it? Hot pot. I can smell that. I'm home.、Mm. Yeah, this is a thing because I was in Chongqing, but I was there by myself, and it's actually quite hard to eat hot. I know. Yes, yes. It's not for just one person. Yeah, I still haven't eaten hot pot in Chongqing, so、oh, I have to go back with a group. You have to go back with a group, and with a group who every one of them can eat spicy food. Yeah. <laughs> Next question, which comes from Rosetta Stone: Do you have a favorite word or phrase in Chinese? I love Chinese. You just have to like learn the logic. You can create your own words. You know.、Mm. Uh, but I do have one word that I very like. It's called Han Xu. I don't even know how to translate. It. It's kind of like ambiguous, vague, and soft, something like that. Sometimes you can use that, like the way of your speaking is very Han Xu. That means I can understand you, but it's not very clear. You know, iceberg. 
um, you only speak the <laughs> level one, mm. but nine levels, I have to understand. I have to interpret it. I hear exactly what you mean. It's actually a really interesting representation of the language because yeah. I think so much Chinese has got this Han Shu, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just like guess what I'm talking about. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Okay, next question, which comes from Naked Retreats. What is your favorite destination within China? So far, Shanghai. Shanghai. I'm very glad I chose to come to Shanghai five years ago. Somehow I just chose Shanghai because maybe like Beijing is too north. Shanghai is more like familiar. And it's also like uh, all the people who live by the Yangtze River will feel like exactly the same feeling. Like we feel that river means so much. Because that's the river that flows through Chongqing, right? Flows through Chongqing, Wuhan, Nanjing, and Shanghai. Mm. So every time when I visit a city that like, has Yangtze River running through it, I feel like, oh, I love the city at the first sight. Mm. Just because the same water feeds us. That's so nice that you can look at the river here in Shanghai and say, that's been through my hometown. Yeah, well, we also have like a very vicious word. Like the Shanghainese people always drink our... <laughs> because Chongqing is very like upper... You're upstream. Yeah, upstream. Like Shanghai is the end of it. <laughs> so, oh, that's sorry. so funny. But I live here now. <laughs> I drink my own... <laughs> that's a whole different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> oh, brilliant. If you left China, what would you miss the most and what would you miss the least? Oh. Because you've never lived overseas, right? Never. No. I can only imagine. Go on then. I would definitely miss Hopper the most. I knew you'd say that. You're so predictable. That's because, like, <laughs> all the people will say the exact same. You're a conformist person. <laughs> I mean, my blood runs with Hopper. <laughs> it's just my soul. You can't help it. What would you miss the least if you left? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, my God. I feel like I'm such a terrible student. I'm so sorry, teacher. Um, <laughs> this is maybe what you're talking about, acceptance. You have to accept yourself. Living in China is about accepting the good and bad, right? Yeah. There you go. I've made it into a clever answer. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Is there anything that still surprises you about life in China? Why might? Oh, why might? As in ordering food online? Yeah. Well, I just can't believe I can just order food like 3 a.m., it still surprised me, even though I'm a Chinese person. And can I guess what kind of food you order on Wai Mai? <laughs> you can't just order like a formal hot pot, but you can order Mao Cai, which is kind of like the hot pot for just one person. That's what I order the most. Of course. Of course. Can you get something which you would say is authentically Chongqing hot pot in Shanghai? No. No, right? I'm sorry, Shanghai, no. But I forgive Shanghai for that. <laughs> because nobody can just do like Chongqing people make. There you go. This is all one big advert for Chongqing, after all. <laughs> Next question, which comes from Smart Shanghai. Where is your favorite place to go out, to eat or drink or just hang out? Elevator. It's near Xu Jiahui, it's Nan Dan Dong Road. It's an underground bar, they do techno music and they hail queer parties. The party that you can always embrace all your gender expression. Uh, once you like dress up as in drag, you can get in for free. Uh -huh. And have you been in drag yourself? Not yet, but... Not yet? I'm so sorry, not yet, but many people want to do it for me because I never know how to do makeup. But they can do it for you. They can do it for me. Between this recording and when it gets released, it's probably a few months. Okay. So my challenge to you is, by the time this episode is released, you have to have had one evening out in drag. Promise? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Next question. What is the best or worst purchase you've made in China? Well, I love Apple products. So the reason Apple products are bought is the watch I'm wearing. Oh, look. So, yes. Nice. The one company that does not need to have advertising on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm such an Apple whore. <laughs> uh, next question. What is your favorite WeChat sticker? Okay, send it to me now. There's a lady doing very funny gesture, kind of like use her hands at the curtain to reveal herself like, huh? <laughs> huh? Hello? I love like people being confident, even though like people don't think they have the guts to be confident. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. What is your go-to song to sing at KTV? Well, I love KTV, so I sing Thank you. Art. Somebody who is young, who loves KTV, I appreciate that. I recently love a very old song in China. It's called Ai Bu Ai Wo Love Me or Not. Uh, it's by a band called Ling Dian Yue Dui. I just like to sing this song because you can just roll. Ni dao di ai bu ai wo. Yeah, and I like how it's like, just tell me yes or no, right? It's that kind of feeling. <laughs> like, do you love me or not? Okay, you and I have to go out. <laughs> and finally, from JustPod, which is the studio we are in today, what or who is your biggest source of inspiration in China? 
uh, first of all, me, myself, and I, of <laughs> course. Also, all the queer people. Ah, oh, there's so many of us. We don't know each other, but like it's the roots underground. We connect to each other somehow through experience, through culture, through everything. Yeah, you can say like, "I feel you." Yeah. There you go, everyone. Feel the love, guys. Xie Xiao, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And before you leave, who is the person who you would recommend that I interview in the next season of Mosaic of China? Lilian Shen. Her Chinese name is Shen Leqi. She grew up in like multiple countries, in Singapore, Shanghai, UK, and US. And she has done so many feminist events and organizations in Shanghai.、Mm. This is long overdue. To talk to somebody who can give the feminist story in China, so I can't wait to talk with Lillian. Yeah, I can say that that issue is very complicated, and she's the right person to talk with. Great. And if there was one question you would ask Lillian, what question would you ask her? Where are you? I haven't met you for like ages. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you, Oscar. So I was looking down my list of all the guests we've had on Mosaic of China so far. And I think Xie Xiao is the 14th LGBTQ+ person we've had on the show, and that's just to my knowledge. There's probably more than that. Sometimes it's good to talk about it. Sometimes it's fine to let it be Han Shu. Just like we don't need to discuss each guest's favorite breakfast, we also don't need to discuss their sexual preferences or gender expression. It's all just part of the mosaic. As always, there's more content in the premium version of the podcast. Head to mosaicofchina.com for details on how to subscribe, and here are some clips from today's show. I appreciate you. I understand you. I love you, but I don't know how to define the terms you just said. My cousin is the only grandchild on her side,、mm. and we both decided we won't have any children. Oh right. They think,、oh, but in my neighborhood, homosexuality is such a taboo. They're afraid to come out to you. They keep the rules vague on purpose,、mm-hmm. so that we never quite know where the line is. I know there are so many queer people in China have a very hard life. I know their stories. I hear them. Are you a comrade? The answer is yes. Both. <laughs> yes. Both. Exactly. <laughs> doesn't matter if your family like accept you or not, but it does matter if you accept you. When I visit Japan, I feel like sometimes they're like more Chinese than Chinese. <laughs> yep. Do you feel that pressure externally still? Never. So many people they don't understand it at all. Right. I wanted to know why. A B C D. They all sounds right, but they all <laughs> sounds wrong. <laughs> I cannot choose all of them. Mosaic of China is me, Oscar Fuchs, with artwork by Denny Newell. As always, there are lots of images alongside today's show on the website or on social media, including Xie Xiao's favorite WeChat sticker, photos of his families, both biological and chosen, and many more. What you won't find there is any photos of him in drag, because he's still leaving that to the professionals. Speaking of which, you're about to hear a quick catch-up with the person who referred Xie Xiao to the mosaic, Coco Santi, from season two, episode five. And there's also a catch-up with the workplace diversity supporter working for SAP, Sebastian Denez, from season one, episode eleven. Please enjoy them. Please listen to their original episodes if you haven't already done so. And we'll be back with another new guest next week. Coco, great、Hi. to see you. Short sao sao, and here you are. <laughs> good to see you, man. Good to see you too. How was your? I don't know what to call it. Forced holiday. Yeah. I've put on a few pounds, but I don't mind being in front of you because you are very body positive. I am, so I'm letting it all hang out. You should let it all hang out. It's funny. The previous lockdown, I gained so much weight because I was just like nom 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 nom. <laughs> but this lockdown, I was just so aware of myself and like I just knew how to like control myself. Oh, okay. You've obviously grown as a person. I think I'm regressing myself. No, it's fine. Everyone needs to experience it at least once. If you didn't do it the last lockdown, you had to have done it this lockdown. I suppose so. How is Kevin doing? Oh, Kevin is wonderful.、Um, he played an eggplant in my previous show. <laughs> Very good. I'm、yeah. not going to mention what Kevin is. If you haven't heard Coco Santi's original episode, it's up to you to go back and listen to it. All will be revealed. Yeah, it is something special. 
So where are you heading towards? Gosh, I am pushing myself a lot to keep creating as much as possible. So my friend and I are starting a podcast, yes. which is great. <laughs> um, we're starting a Disney podcast, Your Bare Necessities, where we just kind of get drunk and talk about Disney movies. <laughs> it sounds really basic because it probably is, but it's like, first, we're going to start with the um, our Disney princess films, and then we're going to go into talking animals, and then Pixar, and then... You've planned it all out. Oh, everything is planned out. You know, I love planning. After the last quarantine, I met with a therapist and a counselor, and I was diagnosed with ADHD, which was a mind-blowing experience for me, because I have ADHD I, which is ADHD internal, which means that everything that I focus on, I hyper focus on. So something like a podcast or making a video take a lot of work because I am hyper focusing on the smallest detail. And that's what concerns me about online content. For me, my perfectionism starts taking over, which is why I prefer live performances, because those little mistakes become not only part of the performance, but they can become the best part. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It, it just, I don't have to beat myself up over making those small imperfections like, oh my God, the sound here doesn't sound right. This clip needs to match up perfectly. Is he turning this way? Is he turning left? It's crazy. I don't know how Kim Kardashian does it. So how are you going to <laughs> stop yourself from doing that in your podcast? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I haven't taken any medication to control it. So. so so what tools do you have then? Internal mental work, yeah. which is just repeating to myself, it's good enough. Yes. So like if I'm organizing magazines on my table, I won't have to like alphabetize them. <laughs> and it's an experience. Yes. <laughs> You're giving me this cheeky like, I can't believe I'm saying this out loud laugh. I'm laughing because it's so familiar to me. Whenever I see anything about ADHD, I do wonder if I have an undiagnosed version of it. Yeah, I highly recommend to get tested for ADHD. Because when I found out I was diagnosed with ADHD, I kind of just broke down and understood all of the factors in my life that could have been better. I don't care how old you are. Definitely get checked out. I have a friend who was diagnosed at 41. Check it out. Just you never know. You can kind of get more control of your own life. And that really does help. Yeah. Interesting. I, I appreciate you opening up about that. I think I read a couple of weeks ago, you posted something about that. So I, I had known that you, you had come out with your ADHD <laughs> diagnosis, something which I had intended to speak to you about. I'm glad that you volunteered it. I think we have to wrap this up. But before we do, um, of course, I'm going to release this catch up episode at the end of the episode with the person who you referred for season three, which is Xie Xiao. Yeah. So have you and Xie Xiao managed to catch up of late? No, we haven't. It's just I'm very busy. I'm always be me, I guess. <laughs> that's, that's a big one. Usually Cinema Q occurs when I'm working. So like, it's hard for me to like go to the movie events. But I highly recommend everyone goes to see uh, queer cinema in any way, shape or form. It's definitely worth it. Coco, thank you so much for coming in. Great that's to scary. see you. It's so good to see you. <laughs> and thank you for being part of this project. Uh, it was a pleasure to speak to you last season. And it's great to see you again today. You too. Can you hear me? I can indeed. Hello, Sebastian. We are doing this call over Zoom, but actually we are both in Shanghai right now, correct? Exactly. I mean, we are on um, the two sides of the city, right? Yes, you are on the Pudong side. I'm on the Pushi side. Just to introduce you to people who did not hear your original episode, you are a French person with an Italian wife working for a German company here in China, correct? <laughs> That's complicated, but correct. <laughs> Last time we talked, you had just moved into a new role in engineering. Now, are you still in that role or have you moved on again? Yeah, no, I'm still there and working on a more international dimension. My team in the past was um, essentially located in China. This new team that I have, we have team members in China, but also in India, in Japan, in Southeast Asia and in Australia and New Zealand. So from a diversity perspective, that makes the job very interesting. Yes. And this is actually touching upon the content that we had in your original episode, which was about workplace diversity 
and how you can engineer a culture in a way that's more accepting and more open. Did you find yourself making any mistakes at the beginning when you have been a little bit more used to just managing Chinese people and just managing salespeople? Like, how was it oh, when you transitioned? Not only at the beginning, still. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, for sure, for sure. Um, you, you take a lot of things for granted. Sales and services organization are working almost like military organization, right? So <laughs> all these mechanics, this uh, focus on financials, on uh, timelines and so on. Um, so uh, for me, uh, one of the major challenge was to understand different cultures, different countries, uh, different organization and timelines, right? Um, and, and eventually how I could on one side benefit from what they already had in place and how I could on the other side bring my experience in management to this organization so that we can progress and make it better at the end of the day, which was essentially the reason why I was um, hired in the first place, right? Yes. Um, it does make me think about our original discussion where we are talking about neurodiversity, the way that you had successfully integrated employees on the autism spectrum. And then, of course, all other kinds of diversity, like age diversity, gender, LGBT, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm leading towards is what do you think is happening when it comes to the conversation around diversity, particularly in China? Do you think it's staying the same? Is it backsliding? Do you still keep tabs of what the state of things are these days? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think we haven't backslided. What on the other side we do see is that the society is not getting um, much better. Uh, because right. China had a moment where it was catching up comparatively to other countries. And now other countries are moving faster. And actually China in the gender diversity ranking, while still making progress, is getting backwards in that ranking. Because mm. many other countries have taken bigger steps, faster steps. So it's a never ending journey at the end. I see. Well, why don't we end our discussion by talking about the future? What, what are your plans? What I can foresee is um, we're not leaving China. Not yet. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yes. Uh, we definitely are looking forward to an improvement of the situation here that uh, I'm sure will come soon. And look with very positive eyes in the future. Good. I look forward to hopefully meeting you again in person. Thank you so much. I'm always grateful to the people from season one, like yourself, who said yes to this project before they even knew what the hell it was. Now we're already in season three, and it's great to have this chance to catch up with you. And I'm hoping that we will continue to stay in touch into the future. Thank you very much, Oscar. You too. Bye-bye.